Okay, thank you. Affirmative. Okay, so now we've got, Stu and I are both in the garden, um, but we're in separate rooms. Um, so let's start with our prayer, okay? Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu Benitzvotav, Betsivanu Laasuk, Vidivre Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who hallows us with mitzvot and commands us to engage with studying the words of Torah. Amen. So the procedures of today, again, are to please mute yourself. And if you want to add something or ask a question, wave your hand or just unmute yourself and speak up. There are not that many of us, and that would be very nice and informal. Um, be sure at the end of today's session to go to the World of Shalom website to complete the online evaluation form at the end of today's session. Okay, so my first questions for the group are to please raise your hands or unmute and say something um, in answer to these questions. How many of you are gardeners? Stuart, how many people are gardeners? I can't see everybody. I can only see six people at a time. We you have can, one, Ellen. You can move your screen arrow and then yeah, see more. Karen, Jerry, <laughs> Can I, Carol. can I, wait, who, yes. who of us are trying to be gardeners? Well, how many of you would like to be Aspire gardeners? Aspire to be gardeners. We are all Aspire to be trying. gardeners. Okay. Paul, how many? We, we got about half of the folks. Okay, and how many of you are just here to see our garden and learn about our garden? Okay, okay. So today, Stuart and I are going to talk about the holiday of Shavuot and the seven principles of urban gardening. We'll use pictures from our garden to illustrate each of these principles. So Stuart, you wanna, uh, well, first let's say hug some to each other. Haksameach is the traditional greeting for um, Shavuot. Um, and Stuart, you want to tell us about Shavuot? Well, Shavuot uh, uh, usually falls uh, on the sixth day of the Hebrew month of Sivan, and it marks seven weeks from Passover. Also ties in with Marsha's seven principles of gardening. It usually falls between May 15th and June 14th. Shavuot uh, recognizes and celebrates the revelation of the Torah on Mount Sinai. It is said in the uh, Mishnah that Mount Sinai, the base of Mount, in the Midrash, the base of Mount Sinai suddenly burst forth in flowers in anticipation of the giving of the Torah. And as recognition of this throughout the years, we have typically decorated our homes and scenery, uh, homes and synagogues with greenery and flowers. And that becomes the segue to garden and gardeners who produce the greenery and flowers for Shavuot. And Shavuot being seven weeks from Passover is really the best and most wonderful time for gardens and for gardeners. It's a season of hope and happiness and plants like promises are coming forth out of the ground. It's a time with the fewest bugs and no mosquitoes. So here are, in honor of Shavuot, Stu and I came up with seven garden principles because Shavuot means seven. And so take a look at these seven principles. I won't read them to you. If you just look at them, then we'll go through each of them in turn. So let's start uh, by welcoming you to the 2200 block of Mount Vernon. That's actually our address and we're located uh, on 22nd Street at the corner of Mount Vernon Street. And the actual entry to our house, um, well, let's start with this, whoa, oh dear. I um, just did something. 
to do something. I think I, okay, here we go. Anyhow, um, let's start with our first principle, and that is that size is not important. Even a window box can be a great place to start, or as in Karen's situation, um, a wine bottle, or for some of you, your deck. Um, here's the uh, walk down 22nd Street uh, to our house. This is walk down from 22nd Street down Mount Vernon Street to our house. And we have these window boxes. Um, these are from window boxes in the spring um, uh, last year. Um, and what you can see as you look at them is um, these pansies. Pansies are wonderful for spring flower boxes. Um, they could start as early as um, they could stay all winter in some cases, um, and they do really well until it gets pretty hot. When it gets hot, we get summer flowers for the summer boxes. Um, and these, um, as you can see, are um, taken in the morning sun. Um, this area doesn't get much sun, but in the morning it gets a little bit. And you can see the, the, the classic principle of how to do a flower box. You've heard of this, I hope, before. Thrillers, spillers, and fillers. The thrillers are these caladium, and um, I think these are kind of African impatience um, that are thrilling. The spillers are these um, um, creeping jenny. They love to just spill over, and some of these begonias. And the rest are just fillers. And so if you're designing flower boxes, that's the rule to follow. Um, but come inside, and here we can see our second principle. And that principle is to be reasonable with your space. So you open the gate. And although this is a garden tour, the first thing you'll see are our cars. And the reason for that is that if you live in the city, the thing you know is that parking is at a premium. And so if you have the space, you should always have parking before all else. As much as it killed me to give up the space to our cars, I knew this was the only way to make our lives livable because we had lived without a parking space in our previous city house. Um, and so we devoted a lot of space over my sadness um, to these uh, two car spots. But you also see in the back, is um, a, a outdoor kitchen under renovation. That's Stuart's grill and that big wall. Stuart, you've been renovating that wall for now about a month or two. Could you tell us why that wall was all white and is not yet finished? Uh, uh, let, Come on, tell the truth. Well, it's not much to do with the garden, but it uh, provides separation between our property and the next door property. And 20 years ago, uh, the Masons did an imperfect job in, with their mortar. And I've been, had, I've been grinding out the mortar joints and repointing. The you took out all the ivy, so it's ball. not green anymore. This used to be all green. Okay. And, and so now um, I hope that in another few weeks we'll finish the mortar job and get the ivy back up, Stu? Perhaps. And we'll, we'll keep going with finishing the kitchen area. But we'll keep walking and we'll turn the corner to get to the front door and stop here at our first water feature. Any comments, Stewie? Well, this is a very gentle fountain which provides tranquility and a slight bubbling sound uh, tranquility before you enter the house uh, it is also i built it uh, out of materials uh, reminiscent of our various trips the uh, basin the vase is uh, vietnamese uh, the stones at the top of the river stones from Costa Rica and the stones at the bottom are beach coral and oyster, calcified oyster shells uh, from Florida. 
Oh, I didn't even know that. Well, thank you. So now, whoops, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. Um, let's, let's go through our front door and through our house. You walk about 10 steps through the house to uh, these doors to the private garden. So here is our private garden, and why don't we take a walk through it? We'll stop right here. Um, this is um, this plant. I think we took this picture last week. This video. Um, this this plant is even more filled with with uh, flowers. It's a clematis. And it's in its third year, and it's a classic example of why you have to have patience. The first year we put it in, it just laid on the ground and didn't do much. The second year, it started to do something. Um, and it sort of followed the classic rules of, of planting for gardeners. The first year, they sleep. The second year, they creep. And the third year, they leap. And what you can see here is this clematis is leaping. And um, it took three years, but it was well worth it. I wish you could be here today because today there are even more flowers on it. Does anyone here um, have a clematis that's currently blossoming? If not, I hope you'll grow some. We have several clematis in our garden and they blossom at different times. So it's really fun to have them. So let's keep walking through the garden. We'll go to the next one. Oh wait. We'll go to the next one. Um, we'll start at the clematis and um, walk across the gate. That looks at 22nd Street. This is a shade bed. Um, some bluebells there and hosta and some polygonarum. And walk over to the fountain that you heard. Oh, there's one of our several turtles. And see this one over here? There's another turtle there. Um, there's some columbine. It's very happy in that place. Um, Marcia, what do you do with the turtles in the winter? Well, um, there, are, there are all four seat, there are all season turtles. Uh, they are very low upkeep. Uh, they're basically plastic. They're plastic. We used to have a real turtle named Spots, and Spots would come um, out in April and sun, and we'll show you his favorite rock. See these turtles, this one, and there's one over here, are plastic. Well, Spots one year just stopped coming out in April, um, but this one here, it looks so real that some animal came and bit its head off. We had to paste its head back on. But they're very low maintenance animals. I recommend them highly. Um, the thing about this, um, this uh, shot is that it illustrates principle number three, know your space. And when in your space, there are sounds and issues of sunlight and water conditions, and to be a decent garden, Gardener, it's important to pay attention to all of those. I would have put smells on here, but I didn't want to tempt you. So that's one that we won't talk about today until we're in person. But in terms of sounds, let's listen to this uh, first uh, fountain here. And what you'll notice is that it's a pretty loud sound. And the reason it's so loud is that on the other side of this garden gate is 22nd Street. And there are buses and motorcycles, as some of you know well, and um, all kinds of noises. And so by having a pretty loud splashing sound, um, that helps to um, keep the noise from the street out and make us feel like we're more in a private garden. But that noise or sound is very different from this one over here in Stewart's Blue Vietnamese Pot. Listen here. It bubbles very gently, but it doesn't overpower the sound of the wind chime that we have nearby or the birds in the um, bird feeder that we keep out in the winter. Um, the next issue about a garden as part of this know your space principle is the light. And uh, sunlight varies from full sunlight to part shade, 
to shade, to even deep shade. And the very same garden will have different areas um, with those conditions. So here's one area of our garden, um, not far from that fountain, which is way back here and over there, you'll see. Um, but here we see two kinds of, of light conditions contiguous to one another. Here, the Deutzia plant with these little white flowers um, is happy in sun or part sun. And it gets that right here. And right next to it is this bleeding heart or dicentra plant. And the bleeding heart likes part shade with maybe a little bit of sun. And so the two of them go next to each other, both have the perfect conditions for them to grow in the light that they need. Um, you would think that a plant with such pretty flowers would need sunlight, but there are a lot of, um, of pretty flowers you can grow in shade or part shade. Um, and since most of us in the city have not full sunlight, it's good to know about some of these part shade or full shade flowers. Here's another example over here. Let's look at this video. These are rosea. This is only the second year of this plant. And as you can see, it's still just about creeping. But what's important is that this one in the back that I'm pointing to is um, near the wall and it's in pretty much deep shade. Um, this plant likes shade. Um, this plant over here, uh, when the trees are not um, in leaf, um, got a lot of sun. And so this plant that likes shade did really better and grew stronger with more flowers when it was in the deep shade. And the one that was in the part shade um, is still lagging a little behind. I'm hoping next year, in its third year, it'll be a little more leapy. Um, know your water conditions. This area, which is right next to where we just saw those rosea, um, is pretty dry. It's further from the fountain. Um, it doesn't get as much water, and it's perfect for dry conditions. So these lilies are happy, they're even happier today um, in the dryness. We have some sedum, sedum, which get pretty pink flowers in the heat of the summer. And these are um, a kind of geranium that's really happy in the coolness and the dryness of right now. And probably next week, they'll be covered with pretty pink flowers. Um, principle number four, I think we're up to, is that every plant has a time and a place. And here we see that every plant has a time. These daffodils, um, I took this picture on April 15th, and they were very happy, as were the tulips, that I had planned to come out perfectly timed to our Seder, so that these tulips would be in front of our Seder table, which is next to the window, and they would uh, delight us. Of course, no one got to see them this year, but these plants were happy in April. Um, just a month later, by May, those tulips were looking pretty awful. Um, the bed, um, the tulips that were in the front with the more sun were just about gone. Uh, the ones in the back were just about dying. And here you see that um, a day or two later, they were really at the end of their time. But have no fear, because time moves on. And Mother's Day, as some of you may know, is the absolute time to plant annuals. That's the time that um, those of us who are gardeners are thrilled because we could go out and start to plant those annuals without fear of frost. So this was a picture of Stuart um, this past Sunday. Um, we had taken out the tulips and moved some of the other um, bulbs and um, planted these African violets. Um, not African violets, these African impatiens, um, and move the pansies around them so that in a few weeks they'll look nice and strong and big and be a nice focus point in this sun to part sun area. But every plant not only has a time, but has a place. And see these beautiful Budalea? When I showed Stuart this picture yesterday, he said, but we don't have Budalea, they're not from our our garden, and I said, no, they're not. 
these are plants I wanted to have in our garden. In fact, we had a Budalea behind the fountain that we had planted a long time ago. And I wanted them because they have these beautiful purple um, flowers and because they are, um, it's, it's, the Budalea is called a butterfly plant because it attracts butterflies. And I thought that would be terrific to have in our garden. But this place, our place, is not the place for this plant. Um, and after a few years of finding just a few tiny flowers and a pretty sad looking plant, we replaced it with this um, Akuba plant. It's a Japanese um, kind of small, slow growing plant that's very happy in the understory and in this dappled sun. Um, it doesn't get a lot of sun. This one did. This one is the one that's thriving and this one is not or no longer in our garden. Um, principle number five is to know your dirt. And since Stuart is so good at this. Stuart, could you tell us a little bit about knowing your dirt? Yes, dirt is important in the garden. It in fact is pretty essential. Uh, most gardens uh, vary somewhere between very acidic to very alkali. Uh, the various ways of treating the soil and depending on your plants, some plants love more alkalis, some, uh, for instance, evergreens love more acidic soil. Uh, best place to find out where, what your soil consists of is through the Penn State Extension Service. They have a soil testing uh, service. Here's the website and uh, advise people to do that. We had our soil tested and now we know we haven't done much about it, but we do add a great deal of mulch every year uh, to supplement the soil. We prefer leaf mulch, sometimes mushroom mulch. It keeps the, the ground moist and becomes uh, integrated into the organic matter. This past March, we bought three yards of leaf mulch from a uh, landscaping supply uh, house uh, in the Philadelphia suburb. And we spent a great deal of effort spreading three cubic yards of leaf mulch. Our eyes were bigger than our garden in that we had a great deal of mulch left over, which is now stored in trash cans. Uh, and yeah, think twice about how much you need for your garden. Principle number six, moving right along, is to grow with your garden. And um, as, as you uh, continue gardening, and those of you who are current gardeners know that you make a few mistakes here or there, like my butterfly bush or whatever, and you need to edit your plants um, and your trees. And editing means that you simply take those out that are not so happy. Um, being a gardener means pruning a lot, which is to cut back the plants that are growing too fast. Solving problems, and there are never a dearth of problems. And, and part of this principle is to expect the expectable and accept the unexpected. So let's look at this first one about pruning. Um, and Stuart, uh, sometimes things get too big for their space. Could you tell us what you're doing right here? Well, we this started Stuart out Hall. with a small fringe tree, which uh, fringe tree. good soil, good dirt, lots of fertilizer, keeps growing. Every year we have water shoots shooting out that have to be trimmed back. Also, the tree branches have to be thinned out. This is one of a number of trees on the property. And uh, one learns to trim them, uh, to prune them. Uh, I've always said there's something wrong with our basic business model. We keep pumping in the fertilizer, the things thrive and grow, and then we have to keep pruning them back. And it starts over each and every year. But still, you know, you love that big stick, right? Yes, there's nothing like being on top of a 12 foot step ladder with a 12 foot, a 10 foot step ladder with a 12 foot pole 
and uh, and your wife taking a picture of you. <laughs> but but part of also growing with your garden is solving problems. And here's a lovely problem we had this past Sunday as we were planting those African impatiens. Take a look at this. We have a uh, soaker irrigation system that uh, runs throughout the gardens. And periodically, the soaker becomes a leaker and uh, starts flooding areas. We have to dig it up. That's area over here where the rocks was flooded. And, um, and we had to do something about it. So Stuart, to the rescue, wait a second, I got the wrong one. Being so, a problem solver, I first attempted to put uh, tourniquets on it, but tourniquets on the uh, irrigation Holes does not work real well. Because it was wet. Uh, uh, so I'm marking it and when it dries off I'll wrap it in uh, electrical tape and have it only slowly uh, drip rather than... The way an irrigation system is supposed to do it. But, but right now it's flooding but we have it marked and we'll take care of that. Um, the nice thing about having a garden is to have garden workers and hard workers. Here's one of them, me on Sunday, and I was busy, I don't know whether you could see it on the bottom back here, but we have some new plants we're going to be putting in um, window boxes tomorrow. Um, so Carol and Paul, when you walk by, you'll see our new window boxes with this stuff that's hardening outside. And I'm watering some things that Stuart had just put in, and I'm smiling away. On the other hand, we have this guy. Not smiling. Uh, yes. Well, this addresses <laughs> what do you do? Addresses Greg's question of how we keep the walkway free of uh, weeds, and what I'm doing is engaging in a rather holy activity, which is separation. I'm s attempting to separate the planting areas from the walkways, the gravel with uh, edging and putting in plastic edging, which will keep the soil on one side and the gravel on the other side. I'm glad to see you have your knee pads on. That, that keeps your knees a little safer. Um, the other thing about growing with your garden is um, the seasons, and seasons are, are critical to a gardener. And one of the beautiful things about seasons is that change is so predictable. So although we didn't have any snow this past year, in previous seasons, it's always been beautiful to see the snow on these um, golden tip junipers here and in our uh, canopy and on the fountain makes it look like a swan of sorts. Um, and so this was about a year or two ago. But then there's also the unpredictable change. This was a snow about two years ago that came a little bit late in the season. So these are some of our daffodils uh, bulbs poking out and some baby tulip uh, leaves coming out in this looks like two inches worth of snow. The, um, <laughs> the petunias, and up to these pansies, pansies, there are some pansies that are very cold hardy and these seem to have not minded the snow too much. They've survived very well. Um, on the other hand, uh, this was an early snow. Um, this was, um, I think I have the date here. This was November 15, 2018. And we had these pretty uh, penta plants uh, that were in that sort of center area of the garden where we put annuals. And they were just um, snowed out. Um, uh, early snows are getting to be somewhat predictable. Here's an early freeze. That was this last November, though we didn't have a lot of snow. It was pretty cold in November. And um, you have to remember to turn the fountain off uh, before it freezes. Um, the other thing about a garden is having pets, and this gets to Carol's concern. We do have a number of pets in our garden. Stuart, this is one that's been following you around for the last, since you started work on the, uh, the reconstructing the wall, but he was here in the garden on Sunday with us. Can you tell us about your friend? Uh, this Robin, seems to appear is conditioned to come out when I come out 
And whenever I used a hose or to water, or I was washing down the dust from grinding on the wall, the worms come out and the robin is right there taking, uh, having a feast. Our next pet um, uh, is that turtle. Remember I said to Carol that um, we have several turtles. This is our brass turtle, uh, a bronze turtle. And this turtle is, um, reminds us of Spots, who's also buried somewhere in the garden that we've never found him. We've never found, we dig in this garden a lot. And that turtle, which was what, about eight inches big, we've never found, no skeleton, nothing. He just evaporated. So this is our way of reminding ourselves of that turtle. Here's a lizard who's out all seasons um, on another rock sunning. Um, this is um, an alligator we brought back from Florida. Um, here, I don't know whether you could see it, but this is a snake we got in Washington, D.C. at the American History Museum. We thought the kids would like playing with the snake. They didn't. <laughs> but it does fit well in the garden. And um, sometimes he scares even me and Stuart when we're walking by, thinking, ah, it's a snake. And but finally, the snake whatever, has no effect on the birds. Not, not at all. We were hoping it would, but it does scare us from time to time, especially when we tease each other and move it. We together. highly recommend bronze uh, pets for the bronze garden. pets. Excellent. The, the main all season so and low maintenance. Right. Well, this one is also a good pet. This little rabbit. You know, a lot of rabbits in the garden eat your um, vegetables and eat your plants and create havoc and mess up the soil. This one just hides forever under the um, oak leaf hydrangea. And the, the coloring is weird because um, it's usually dark where he hides. And so when I took the picture, he turned a little green. Um, and so our last slide, uh, or not our last one, close, um, is that gardens live in Jewish time. There's loss and there's growth. And as each plant fades, there's a new one coming. And this one, I took this picture Sunday also. This one, I don't know whether any of you recognize it, is a hibiscus plant. Um, it, it looks dead most of the uh, winter, but then it comes up with these little shoots. And now um, it's about a foot high. At the beginning of July, it'll be eight feet tall. It'll have these huge red blossoms that are about 10 inches across. And each day a blossom forms just fully done and gorgeous. And then the next day it's wilted and there's another one right next to it coming up. So this is a really amazing plant that it could live in the winters here in Philadelphia and be so ugly in the winter and so beautiful in the summer. Um, so that's really our presentation today. Our Zoom room is open. Um, we welcome your comments and your suggestions and your questions. Um, anybody? That was great. I have a couple of uh, answers for people who've been asking questions oh, on chat. Uh, the chat. Oh, good. Why don't we start with that? And I'll first come back to Greg's uh, question about the walkways. Uh, I said we use edging to have separation. And Greg asked, what about the weeds that grow in the gravel? I burn them out with a weed burner. It's like a uh, flamethrower. Uh, that's specifically made for burning weeds. It uses a small can of propane. And it's very cathartic also when you just sizzle all of the weeds. Uh, we have... Uh, my every morning and I just pull the little out. We have a question for Marsha. Yeah. And this is about buying plants. Oh, oh, I, I wonder what happened. I had a thing on buying plants. I think I, I must have lost that slide, but yes. Okay, just answer it online. Okay, what, well, how to buy plants? We could get some things at Home Depot, and right now Home Depot is even open if you want to buy plants. Um, um, so that's a place. Um, I love to go to Laurel Hill Gardens on Germantown Avenue. 
that's my favorite place um, because there are several people there. Susan is one of the women there, and she gives me suggestions of plants that go well together, plants to try in my window box. And it's nice to talk to a real gardener. So Susan at Laurel Hill Gardens is a perfect person when that store opens up. Um, and the other place I buy a lot of things from is White Flower Farms. It's an online. There are lots of online places. Some of them I have not liked. White Flower Farms people don't like. They say because it's too expensive and the pictures don't really fit in the sun. Could somebody become very noisy? There. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so White Flower Farms is easy online. Uh, this season they've been mostly sold out. Um, White Flower Farms is um, very reliable and will give you your money back if the plants don't come up the next year or if they don't take. Um, they're expensive, but my feeling is if it's expensive, hey, <laughs> it's worth it. Um, so I've been very happy with White Flower Farms. And they have wonderful catalogs and a great online and perfect customer service. So those are three good places to get um, things from. We bought this year some seeds. Um, and I've also bought uh, from a few other nice places online. Um, John Sheepers is one that has some nice bulbs. Okay, uh, the other part of the question was fountain accessories. Uh, the, the big water fountain you saw, uh, we had commissioned by an artist in Australia many years ago, and we bought it online uh, in the early days of the internet. We also have a number of Sculptures. Oh wait, we didn't show the sculptures. Let me go back to that. Um, we have I... sculptures in the garden, so we have also a sculpture garden, and uh, they're from Australia, and also a local sculptor, uh, Joe Mooney. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> small fountain in front of our house, I built from this uh, pot from uh, Vietnam, a pump, a small pump you buy online and plastic and ingenuity in all modesty. Um, you know what, Stuart? I seem to have uh, messed up on that. We skipped a few slides. So let me see if I could share my screen and show some of those sculptures. Well, that's okay. Maybe just the one profound connections if you have uh, it. I to if share not, uh, another nursery we use is uh, Top Dog. Uh, for the mulch, and they've been very reliable and reasonable, and they send the dump truck out, and it works very well. Um, Still, so you want to talk about these sculptures? Whoops. Yeah, see, something is going a little crazy here. Hold on a second, everybody. I will do this. Um, okay, uh, another question that was on the chat were mosquitoes. Uh, try to attract more birds to uh, deal with the mosquitoes. Um, we put out those mosquito rings in the water, which seem to help. The other thing is to try to just do away with any standing water, any place. Uh, there's also these uh, organic pellets that uh, you throw out and we throw out uh, after a rain on uh, large leaves uh, and that allegedly uh, reduces the number of mosquitoes. The other thing is we just don't go out. <laughs> we look at the, uh, the garden through the window and uh, work out there with lots of mosquito repellent and stay away from the garden uh, at dusk. Okay, other question. Uh, I think, how often do we water the plants? We're, someone's mic. Someone's. How, how often do we water the plants? Uh, 
um, whenever they need it. Um, we do have a watering system, and if I'm too lazy to water by hand, I turn that on. You can see the watering system. If I'm sharing the screen now, and the watering system is behind here. Uh, there's some watering uh, automatics things there. Um, and I usually put that on every four days for an hour and a half. Um, but if it's raining, we don't. Uh, if we've newly planted, we do. Um, so it really depends. We could be more sophisticated. It's on a full screen. It is on full screen, isn't it? Oh, we have two. Oh, okay, I'll get that. Hold on, I see it. Hold on. Oops. For some reason, it's not being responsive. Duplicate. Okay, how's that? Can you see that? There we go. Okay. So, so you want to talk about some of these sculptures? This, for some reason, I must have skipped over it in the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, uh, this hanging from one of the large um, junipers is a crystal orb uh, in a spiral uh, metal screw. And when the wind blows strongly, this moves up and down. And we got it from a uh, uh, craft show in Portland. This is a seven foot uh, sculpture by uh, stainless steel uh, by Joe Mooney, uh, Philadelphia artist. And its companion is a small one about two and a half feet tall, which is in another part of the garden. Uh, this sculpture is Moon Wave by uh, Ruby Jazz, Jazz uh, an Australian uh, sculptor. Uh, who also made the fountain. This is made by friends of ours who are craftspeople in Oakland, California. It's called the uh, straight face and rather whimsical. It adds a little whimsical uh, touch. And this uh, large sculpture, which is attached to Holly and Andy Kleeman's wall, which forms one end of our property, uh, is made up of 18 unique individual pieces no, still, which still, are clustered still, into 27, three sets or of 27 nine. rather, 27 individual pieces which are clustered into three communities or clusters of pieces which are all attached and become one composition. And we call this profound connections. It's quite beautiful when uh, the sun uh, hits it. It's and again, I think uh, stainless steel. And we worked with Joe to design a sculpture that, that really captured what it meant to have profound connections. So that sort of, those are the videos. I'm sorry they got out of order. Not sure why. Um, Stuart, do we get any more in the chat that we should see? Uh, have we ever participated in the plant exchange run by the Horticultural Society? Have well, we? We, we, we used to be a member. We've been a member for many years. Um, some years we are, some years we aren't. We, we go to their free plant things. I've never had much luck with any of their plants. <laughs> but we go and we try to support them. Sometimes. And there's one question from Gail Stewart. What big lessons did you learn by working as an agricultural advisor in Afghanistan? Big lesson is humility. Whenever you think you know it all, uh, you really don't. And uh, you have to be aware of your your, your context, your plants, your ground, and what's the purpose of the plantings. And that's, any other uh, questions, folks? Raise your hand or enter Let's them go. into the chat. We'll mute, unmute. Uh, Jerry Silverman, uh, said for everyone to look up Drip Depot online. It's a lifesaver. 
What's the Nine curve? Nine hooks up to outdoor faucet, drip hoses plus thin hoses with stakes that go into the pot. Sounds like a terrific resource that I think I'll look up immediately. Yeah, I, I have uh, about 50 plants all in pots or boxes and some are on the ground level in the parking lot, some are outside my front door and some are on the third floor deck. So you hook this up to the outdoor faucet. It's got a timer and you can set it for any number of, any combinations like you want it to go one, four times a day for three minutes at a time or once a day for 15 minutes at a time, whatever combination you want. And they, they have different kinds of timers. Some are more sophisticated, it depends on your needs. And then you just turn on the, you turn on the faucet and then when the timer goes off, the water goes through these bigger hoses. I think they're half inch hoses and they take, you, and you install it yourself, you know, you can cut them apart, whatever. And then they lead to where their, your plants are. And then you, you pop in the smaller hoses. And then at the end of each little hose, you put a sprayer or a dripper and that has a stake on it. You stick that in the pot and then you walk away and you never have to deal with watering ever again. And, you can you can rearrange them. You can stop them up. You can move them. You can replace them. Honest to God, it completely changed my life because I used to waste so much time and money because I would forget to water or I would travel and come back and it, everything would be burnt out or whatever. So I highly, highly recommend. And as the years went on, they started out with a really simple arrangement of stuff you could buy. And now it's it's hundreds of different cool tools that you can use to really narrow down to exactly what you need for your garden. Yeah, I think Great. we had something like that when we had a deck garden in our old house. And right. we would have chips that were designed to go to we particular We had a drip spots. system, yeah. right. That's wonderful. Um, we originally uh, learned about it uh, in Israel yeah. uh, when they had the drip right. system, uh, whatever, 30 years ago it was used commonly in Israel. And then we saw it and installed it in a roof there. I have another question here again from Greg, who apparently has issues with weeds in uh, the walkway. Uh, <coughs> underneath our gravel walkway, we have a uh, ground cloth. You know, it's a permeable, water permeable cloth, but uh, plants do not grow up through it. And that's at the base of the gravel. I have to say, um, Weeds, weeds come up every day, sometimes twice a day. I know that I was just in that spot that morning and there were no weeds, and now they are. And it's sort of like just something that when you walk in the garden, I just pick up and put in my pocket or put in a little bag. Um, it's part of the growingness of a garden. And if you get them early, they're still cute. Um, if you wait too long, they become ugly. Um, you can see the mess in the washing machine after <laughs> Marsha's uh, clothes with all the weeds in the pockets. <laughs> you know, one of the things, and Ruth, I think it's you who talked about how nice it is to um, put fountains underneath your windows, and, and that's lovely. Um, you asked, though, also about the ideal conditions for planting clematis. Um, I have learned a lot because we've killed a number of clematis plants. We now have about 10 or so, but we used to have over the years even more, um, which is part of being a gardener, pruning and editing your plants. Um, but clematis like to be in kind of part sun and they like their bottoms to be in shade so that it keeps it moist and there's no sun going to the roots. So I usually plant things around the bottom, whether it's hosta or something around the bottom of the, um, of the roots of the clematis, and then they grow up um, into the sun and the pot sun. And so that's really the best way. A liriope is a good thing to put next to it, or a, um, um, an oak leaf hydrangea is a really nice shade for clematis. Um, and clematis, can be transplanted sometimes, sometimes they can't. Um, I like to go out every day or every other day and make sure that they're staked well so they don't fall over. Um, 
they do get wilt once in a while, but they seem to recover from wilt if you cut them back quickly. So, um, and there's the, always the problem of whether a number one, number two, or a number three clematis. That's why they have garden books. <laughs> so you can look that stuff up. Marcia, can I have a question? No, maybe yes. I'm yes, no, you're fine, Ellen. Oh, oh, is that is that lilac that's on the pergola behind Stuart? No, it's wisteria. It's wisteria. So um, uh, it's very beautiful. And uh, I'm wondering what conditions uh, are necessary for that. Um, I don't know, but uh, once it takes hold, uh, you have to be careful about sitting under it, uh, falling asleep. We used to have a hammock uh, under it. If you sleep too long, it uh, reaches down and chokes you. It grows <laughs> incredibly fast. Literally, you can sit there and watch it grow six to eight inches a day. Yeah, it's very fast growing. And it has to be pruned a lot to keep those flowers. Um, the so flowers the fall, are Yeah, in the fall, we do a rather severe pruning. And you prune it back so that you leave about five leaf nodes on the old wood and everything else goes. And then the flowers uh, in the spring come from the old wood. Could I grow it against a fence? Excuse me? Could I grow it against a fence? Oh, you can grow it all over, it's a vine. And oh, I'm you. continuously, uh, every week, cutting it mm -hmm. out of the junipers behind it. It sends up these tentacles that goes ah, and grabs on and it will just choke out everything. But it does need sun. You have to be sure you have sun, right, Stuart? Yes. But the crops have to be in sun to get the flowers. Okay, thank you. Is it, is it all day sun or just sun at some time? Uh, a few I think hours. Hours would be fine. We could do you know, morning sun, afternoon sun, but probably about four or five hours of sun. Just not at, just not at night. <laughs> right, no sun. Thank at you, Jerry. <laughs> it grows fast enough the way it is. Yeah. If. Yeah. Yes, can I ask another question? Can I ask another question on the watering? Yes. Um, you know, I'm told by some people you should water it in at, in the evening. Other people say no when the sun's out. Is is there any rule on on when you water? Yes. If you water at night, the reason they say not to water at night is because if there's water left on the leaves, it won't evaporate by the sun. So that could um, encourage the growth of mosquitoes. I worry. And the other reason to not water at night is then uh, the plant doesn't dry out and so it might get fungus or um, it, it might grow things that you don't want to grow. Um, so it's better to water in the morning when the roots are waking up and soaking up the water and then it uses that energy through the, that water through the day as the heat builds up. And then by the evening, it's dry and it won't be growing mold and fungus and things like that at night. So that's why you want to water in the morning. Or maybe I sometimes water in the afternoon, so long as I know it's going to dry out by evening. Did you say, hi, this is Greg. One last question here. Uh, thank you very much, by the way. It's very interesting and very informative. Uh, could you say something about what zone we are in and how these zones are determined? Yeah, we're in zone seven. I'm pretty sure, although it could be six, and it, it, it's, it's changing. Um, so you can look at almost any book. Here's one. I, I meant to put in a bibliography. I didn't. You can see this book on the screen. It's disappeared. Yeah, I can't see it. But almost any good uh, gardening book will show a map. In fact, you could go online, and there are maps of garden zones. Usually six and seven is where we are here. But we're getting warmer. We're getting a little. It is uh, changing. There's a really good book I recommend. It just came out last year. It's called A Glorious Shade. Glorious Shade backwards. Um, and this is by uh, the senior director at Meadowbrook Farm. 
And she talks about Microphone's picking up a lot of noise. Jerry? Yeah. All right. Yeah. There's some. Okay, everybody's yeah. muted. Question? No, that's okay. Um, we were talking about books, but this book um, by Jenny Rose Carey is called Glorious Shade. And since most of us have shade in our gardens and don't know what to do because most of the annuals that come out say they are for sun, um, it's a good book to look at and it has a lot of wonderful suggestions and beautiful prose. Jerry, did you have a question? No, I thought somebody was, asking, was calling my name, but I was going to say, Stan, if the, the advantage of the dripper system is that the leaves never get wet because the water goes directly into the soil, so you never have to worry about burned leaves or anything. Yeah, that's a really nice uh, aspect of a drip system. Uh, I, this is Jeffrey. Uh, I'm really enjoying uh, the backdrop behind you. Uh, you look great right there. You should stay there for the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, Thank you, yes. I'm in another part of the garden from Stuart. I'm in what we call a dry gulch. Um, it's sort of to Stuart's left. Um, and, and this is uh, a bunch of stones we put in because when we built the house 20 years ago, they said we needed to have a drain in the middle of the garden. So we put a drain in and then we put these rocks on top. And so it, it's part of the garden. And then we got to plant a lot of things by it. You see the ryope there. I'm not sure what else is there. It's kind of dark. I see a lot of liriope and probably our oak leaf hydrangea. I know I can see this. One. Ah, here's oak leaf hydrangea, liriope, and some. Um, oh, this is some old daffodils. Um, oh, this is our Japanese um, maple right here. Uh, Japanese maple. And this is oak leaf hydrangea, and this is the golden tipped juniper. Now, you mentioned several times uh, about fertilizing. Uh, do you use uh, uh, chemical fertilizer, organic? Uh, what about organic soil versus inorganic soil? Well, we used to listen to that show, uh, What's My Garden? And what was that called, Stuart? Um, it was uh, Michael, Mike. You bet yeah. your garden. You bet yeah. your garden. I love You Bet Your Garden, and he was a really strong organic gardener. So we do almost everything organically because it made sense. And miracle Grow that I sometimes once in a while use if I can't get anything else um, is, a, is a chemical. I don't mind chemicals, but it may burn the plants or it may lead to a certain salt buildup or buildup of things that you don't want. You want something that will break down. So I found some really good liquid um, liquid fertilizers that I could use in our flower boxes because flower boxes have to be watered, fertilized, at least I think every time you water them. And so a li good liquid organic um, fertilizer for every time you water that you can get at Amazon online is really good. Just put a little bit in and every time you water it gets fertilized. Roses need to be fertilized at least once a month, usually with an organic rose fertilizer. Um, and anything that has flowers almost always needs to be fertilized, except for clematis. I don't think, does anybody know, I don't think you have to fertilize clematis. I don't fertilize those. Although I have had a problem with my climbing hydrangea. They're supposed to flower. And in the 15 years I've had them, they've never flowered. But I'm experimenting now to cut them back hard. Um, and it seems like flowers grow a new growth. So I'll let you know if that works. And I'm also trying to fertilize those more. But generally, the leaves are beautiful. So I'm kind of happy even without the flowers. But it's a challenge. And sometimes, you know, a gardener wants a challenge. So um, we'll see if I get those flowers on the climbing hydrangea. Thanks. Any other people's ideas about fertilizer? There's a lot of differences of opinion there. Stuart, you're talking, but you're on mute. Stuart, you're... Well, you muted me. <laughs> now you're fine. 
Okay, it's time to close down. Uh, we thank everyone for participating. Thank and you. If you direct uh, um, questions to Marsha by email, uh, we would appreciate that. And please uh, go to the RS website uh, to evaluate uh, this class. I want to thank Ellen and thank everyone for Gail participating for us up and for inviting us to do this. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm glad we had the opportunity. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Gail. And thank you for everyone who's come. Bye bye. Thank Thanks so much. Thanks, Marcia. Have a little while. Bye bye. Thanks, Marcia. Thanks, Stuart. It's beautiful. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for your suggestions. Thanks for sure. coming. Pleasure. Pleasure. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Karen. Maybe sometime you could. Uh, Bye -bye. Uh, I would well, love to photograph your gardens. Oh, I'd love you to do that. You can see I'm not so good at that, but sometime when the uh, corona is gone, we'd when love the to. The plague that. is over. Exactly. Thank Bye. you. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Keep us in mind.